Issues of conflict remain some of the most burdensome things that I deal with as a pastor. In fact, when I look back at, and I think probably anybody here, and we actually have several who could lay claim to this, uh, anyone here who served uh, as a pastor in any way, shape, or form, I think could also probably agree with that. That's my guess. That's the limb I'm going to walk out on, is that conflict among the body of Christ is a far greater burden on pastors than really anything else. I, I think through over the past 15 some odd years that I have been in pastoral ministry, uh, just some of the difficult things that, that, that I've walked through, that most pastors have walked through, uh, and, and probably up there, a really uh, a big one would be when uh, someone in the body loses a child. Uh, that, that, those are tough funerals, right? Those are just difficult time periods, uh, first and foremost for that family, for those parents. Uh, and then for the body of Christ that just loves them and grieves with them and can't solve that problem for them, but just sees the pain that they're going through. And we're experiencing that to some degree uh, with them and alongside of them. And those are difficult, gut-wrenching moments. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's not those events that months uh, or years later keep me awake at night. Uh, because, and partly because there's just this complete and overwhelming trust that I have in God, that the judge of all the earth will do what's right. And, you know, David makes this prayer and this anticipation and longing and expectation of seeing the child that he lost again one day. And I look to those verses with assurance and hope and, and trust that my God will do what's right in those situations. And, and as painful as it is, leave those situations with him. Uh, but what keeps me awake as a pastor at night is conflict, not only my own personal conflict, but conflict that, that I see within the body. And I just want to first praise God for this assembly uh, the last uh, eight plus months that we have been here. Uh, I'm not going to say, you know, it's just like all roses. That's not my point. But uh, this is a congregation that, that seems to have this desire for peace and grace. Uh, and, and I don't know if you're aware of how rare that is. Uh, when you look at uh, evangelical churches all across the United States, it's a rare thing for a body of Christ to actually get along, uh, to actually like each other to look forward to being each other's company. And you think, well, most churches are that way. No, most churches really aren't that way. Uh, and it never ceases to amaze me. And it's just not church people. It's any group of people that you get together for anything. It never ceases to amaze me the people who will willingly come together on a Sunday morning and sing praise songs and listen to a sermon and really dislike most of the other people who they're coming to church with. I don't get that. But that's what tends to happen so very often. And it's the conflict within the body of Christ that really keeps me awake uh, often at night. It's those things that are aggravating. It's those issues that you feel that load and, uh, of stress. And, and, and my own role is a little bit different because I often get invited into or called into the 10 situations. It's not every single one. Uh, one, there's, there, we, we have three pastors on staff. We have lay elders. Uh, and if those situations do happen to arise, I share that with those guys. And, and, it's, and we're not in every situation anyway, but we do tend to get called into marriage conflicts, arguments among the body of Christ, uh, arguments among adult children with parents and all of the various things and tensions that you've heard of or maybe you've been involved in. Uh, I often tend to play a role in some of those things. And it's a difficult thing. In fact, I would so, and, and any counselor would say this to you, anybody who's like in a private practice or they work in, in a nonprofit someplace, they much prefer doing one-on-one -on -one counseling than couple counseling or family counseling, the same way a police officer would rather respond to a meth bust than he would a domestic uh, situation, right? Because it, those things get complex very quickly. Uh, and you can begin that meeting uh, with one person liking you and the other person not liking you, and that can switch in the meeting, or they can both really just hate you at some course during that meeting, uh, or both love you, and then you're not even sure what's going to happen there. It's volatile, it's complex, there's tons of emotions being thrown around, and, and when you get anybody, me or you or anybody else who steps into that, you feel all of those emotions being kind of thrown at your way, and you don't really sometimes know how to move forward through that situation because it's ugly. That's what conflict is. 
It's an ugly situation, and many of you have played at some point in your life the role of mediator, trying to bring peace, maybe to your own family system, maybe to a group of friends who are fighting. It's an awkward, difficult, stressful role to play because people you love and people you care about are in conflict with one another. Or maybe you're the individual who has been or is in conflict. Maybe the person who is really offended by somebody else's behavior. Maybe you're the person who's um, been accused of doing the offense. And you look at your own heart and your own soul and you believe your actions were right and proper, maybe even righteous and good. But yet there's this loss of relationship and you want it fixed and you want it solved. The Bible speaks directly to this issue, actually on multiple of occasions. The more I read through the New Testament, the more, and even the Old Testament, the more I realize that our relationships to each other among the body of Christ, and so I put our family systems in that as well, right? You have believing spouse with believing spouse, uh, and you have maybe a, a believing adult children, but yet there's still conflict that comes in to those situations or the friendships that we have within the body, both those who attend Cascades uh, and those believers who don't attend here but are in your life, right? And when conflict comes in, the Bible has a lot to say about that, and it's amazing to me that Jesus is, yes, interested in saving people, okay? That's why he came, right? But Jesus never came simply to save us. He came to change us, right? He came to recreate us in his image. And you have these two words that, that uh, sometimes they appear, depending on what Bible translation you have, and theologians really like the words, and they're, they're important words to us. You have two words that really define the entirety of the Christian life. One is this word justification, that process by which, or the way in which Jesus saves us, right? We didn't work for it, we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it, and many of us, it seems like we didn't even want it, right? We were just like running a completely opposite direction of Jesus. Jesus, but Jesus found us, chased us down, grabbed us, and he made us his own, right? He took all, everything that was right with him and everything that was wrong with us, he took everything wrong with us and he took that away and everything right with him he put inside of us and we stand as forgiven and redeemed and in the court of God's law, we have been declared uh, innocent, declared guiltless, declared holy and righteous. Justified is the word that we use to describe that. And so that's that process by which we get saved. And then you have this other hugely important word, sanctification, uh, which basically means being holified or, uh, or, or, or being made holy. Uh, and it's that process through which after we have been declared righteous that we begin to live out more and more and more what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We've been declared righteous, justified, and then we actually begin to live out that righteousness more and more and more. That's sanctification. In other words, it's just our daily spiritual growth. And so when you have those two words in mind that encompass really all of Christianity, the third word, by the way, is a word that's still off in the distance for us. And that word is, is, theologians refer to it as glorification, that, that time either when our natural life ends and we go to the Father, or if we happen to live in the end of days, the Son returns, right, and gathers those who are His, uh, and then we are presented in heaven, uh, the final battle being won, this battle against sin on a daily basis now being over, and it's just God and His people for all of eternity uh, in a relationship of righteousness and wholeness with Him and with each other. That's a glory filling idea. It's a glory, glorious idea, which is where you get the word glorification from. Justification, how we become believers. Sanctification, how we live out that faith. And then we all look forward to this glory thing that's coming in the future, right? But let's go back to that middle word, that word sanctification, living out our faith more and more, being like Jesus a little bit more each day, right? That's sort of the, the hope and the goal and the movement of a believer. And when we look at that word or that concept and we turn to the pages of the Bible, particularly the New Testament, it says a lot, an awful lot about how we relate to each other. 
I mean, it calls out specific relationships, husband and wife, employee and employer, or to be even more specific to the New Testament time period, slave and slave owner, parent and child, right? Persecutor and the person being persecuted, and all of those kinds of relationships, many of which were just twisted and sick, right? But Jesus has spoken in even to those relationships. Jesus stands ready to bring peace and restoration if both parties are willing, even to those relationships. And so as we began this series, The Art of Solving Conflict, last week we looked at some things that we have to do in our own heart to prepare ourselves before we even attempt to go to the other person and solve the conflict. One, I think we're not gonna go through the whole thing, but one, take the matter to God in prayer as number one. Before you do anything, before you say anything, uh, before you even think anything, just get on your knees and take the issue to God in prayer. Another point that we made last week is we have to remind ourselves that the other person is important to us. And that leads us to Matthew chapter 18. And Tim is right. This is, I think, the first sermon uh, that I preached when I was here uh, back in December, maybe, I think it was. And we walked through the entire chapter. Our goal in that time was a little bit different uh, than our goal is today. There we were looking at the entire chapter and what it had to say about how important people are to God. And today our focus is really just on a couple of verses within that chapter. But let's set that context again because that context is so very important for us to understand this chapter. So Jesus is preaching a sermon. Look in Matthew chapter 18, look at verse one. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, okay? So at that time, it's, it's specifying a certain time period, okay? There's a question, and then the rest of the chapter is Jesus' answer to that question. So look at chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse one. When Jesus finished saying these words, he departed from Galilee and he came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, okay? So I only bring that to your attention to say uh, that after he's done, it's a whole nother story, right? It's a whole other context. He actually physically leaves that place and goes someplace else. So chapter 18 is a self-contained unit. The entire chapter was set at one time, okay? We would refer to that as a sermon, Jesus preached a sermon, okay? Or Jesus had a conversation with, but we only get his side of the conversation. Uh, and there's points to the sermon and there's subpoints to the sermon. And verses 15 through 17 that we're looking at today, which we usually refer to and think of as the church discipline section or the how you confront somebody section, is really just a subpoint of Jesus' overall point. He's really not talking about church discipline, although we can correctly apply it to that. He's really not really even discussing how you confront someone, although clearly those verses are dealing with that issue, right? The sermon is dealing with a much more important subject, and that's this. You had some disciples who came to Jesus, and they asked a question. It's a simple question. It's an honest question, right? But it's a question that betrayed a wrong mindset. Who is the greatest? in the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of like moms for you guys. That's kind of like when your elementary school child comes up to you and says, mom, do you agree with me that my big sister is a big meanie, right? I mean, you can answer that question. It's an honest question, but the question itself is probably betraying her mindset at that moment in time, right? And it's probably not the best mindset that she could have. The same thing with the disciples. They ask this question of Jesus, who is the greatest? And Jesus, in characteristic fashion, refuses to answer the question. Do you notice he does that a lot? Uh, I mean, read through the Gospels. People ask Jesus a question. Sometimes it's like the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus or the Sadducees trying to trap Jesus. And sometimes it's just the disciples themselves. They're not trying to trap Jesus, but the question itself indicates a wrong starting point. And instead of answering the question, which is to legitimize the starting point, Jesus really kind of changes the subject entirely. And he does that here. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a question about, am I more important than these guys next to you? I'm not 100% sure who was all involved in these questions. 
You know, was, was Peter a little worried that he wasn't getting the recognition? If there was a leader among the group, Peter seemed to certainly vie for that position. Or, or maybe it was one of the sons of Zebedee, and, and they were kind of a fiery temperament themselves. Or maybe, you know, poor Bartholomew. You never hear about that guy, right? I mean, what did he do? Um, but maybe he was just thinking he wasn't getting the recognition that he deserved, right? Maybe he was the one of the individuals pushing for that question. Maybe his humility would win out and he would be placed on top of everybody else. I got no idea the various players who were involved in this thing, right? We get hints elsewhere as to who they might be, but we don't know the full extent of it. And instead of answering that question, Jesus launches into a conversation about the importance of other people. That's the sermon of chapter 18, how important other people are. I'm not going to go through the whole thing with you, but let's look down, if we can, in verse 12. He says this, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And in fact, he begins the entire sermon with a conversation which to our modern ears sounds really kind of cute, right? He brings the little children to him, right? And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like these little kids. If you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be like these little children. And we tend to forget the culture and the time period, at least with an evangelical focus on the family. James Dobson Christianity. I don't mean that as an insult. I actually think those ministries are great. Uh, within that version of Christianity, when we mention family and we mention kids, it's seen as a positive thing, right? Uh, and, and so and you guys, particularly those with you have large families, right? You come to Cascades or churches like Cascades and people see that you have multiple children, five, six, seven, eight or more children. Uh, that's kind of like a cool thing. That's like really awesome. But you also know that when you leave sort of that evangelical world, people kind of stare at you funny, Right? Uh, and, and you guys have reported that to me like, hey, they just like, give us weird looks. Or if there's a discount for kids, restaurants like cut us off after the third one. They're like, absolutely not. It's, it's way too much money that we're losing, right? Uh, and, and so you, you step out of the evangelical world and you get a little bit of a taste uh, of kind of what's going on here, but it's even worse in this culture and time where women are not valued highly, children are not seen as significant. They're viewed, particularly in Roman society, they're viewed as property, right? Not so much for the Jewish world, but in the Roman world, in many cases, if you were a Roman citizen, you could kill your own children without fear of police involvement or punishment of any kind right? They were your property. You could do with them what you wished, okay? That's the culture. That's the backdrop that Jesus is speaking in. So when Jesus has the little kids come to him, he, he, is, he is doing something that's a little bit insulting. The disciples want to know who's the most important, and Jesus brings some of the most insignificant people in society, and he says, these are the most important. And not only are they the most important to me, to the Father, they have to be the most important to you. And that's where he takes the conversation in the sermon, right? And so if you have your hand out, if you're a person who fills that out, um, let me suggest this. As you begin to approach whatever conflict that you're in, or you're going to help someone approach a conflict that they, that they might be in, it's important that we view the person who sinned against you as the lost sheep, not as the dangerous wolf, right? They're the lost sheep. They're not the dangerous wolf. And we have a tendency when people wrong us and they hurt us or they speak against us or they slander us, we all, myself included, have a tendency to see them as the enemy. They're the dangerous people and we can kind of take on this sort of medieval knight persona uh, where we come in riding the white horse, we have our sword and we are going to protect God's people from this person who sinned against me, right? Right? 
I mean, we, we kind of project ourselves and we view ourselves that way when Jesus has already, before we even get to verse 15 with how to deal with conflict, he's already changed the focus of the conversation and he's inviting us to shift our mental attitudes towards that person. They're not the dangerous wolf. They are the lost sheep that we're seeking to find and restore, right? It's a mindset issue. And brothers and sisters, I think it is incredibly important that before we get anywhere close to verse 15 and the subject contained in verse 15, we've got 14 or really 13 from verse 2 on, 13 verses dealing with the need to shift our mindset towards other people before we ever get how to approach that other person. We've got to view them not as the dangerous wolf, but instead as the lost sheep, okay? One of the saddest parts about being a pastor, and, and, and this is, uh, many of you can speak to the same situation. Uh, I can only speak kind of com- from my point of view. From my point of view, uh, I have to take public stands on things, sometimes that aren't popular, uh, things that I believe are from God's word, uh, and I, I try to stand on only those things that I believe are from God's word. If it's a personal opinion, I, if I can recognize that as such, I try to say, hey, this is just my personal opinion, but if it's something that I believe is biblical and I'm absolutely confident is biblical, I'll take a stand on that issue. That's not always a popular stand to take, particularly in our day and age, just, just the sexuality issue alone, right? Just that one issue Uh, I have people in my life, people who I'm related to, people who I have been friends with for years that won't even speak to me now because of the various views that I hold, which I look at Scripture and I glean from Scripture, and sometimes it's just me simply repeating Scripture, or other issues. I have people who bring conflicts to me, and sometimes I can't decide or don't believe I should biblically decide between the two issues, and I stay somewhat neutral on the issue and just try to help them solve it, and then I have one or sometimes both parties that become I'm infuriated because I won't take a stand on the, an issue that they want me to take a stand on. And yes, over the last 15 years, I have met people that I love and care for and at one point had a deep and connecting and joy-producing relationship with who, and I've experienced this, if they see me walking down the street, they literally cross the road to avoid contact. That breaks me, guys. To this day, I go home and weep over those situations. I hate having lost relationships. I also understand that when we take a stand for Jesus in any way, even as peaceful and as loving and as gentle as we can possibly do it, that sometimes there are lost relationships that we can't recover. But here's my prayer. I pray that that is never because I've sabotaged the attempt at reconciliation, that I've done something sinful, I've done something stupid, or I failed to gently, lovingly, patiently, pursuedly go after someone with whom a relationship is lost. I pray it's never for that reason, and sometimes I believe it probably has been. But when I begin to view the other person not as the dangerous wolf, it, by the way, even, even the sheep who bite, because <laughs> you've been bitten. You've been bitten by people that you love, that you care about. And you know, when you're being bitten at that moment in time, uh, at least the pain that's coming that's being generated, I'm not sure you really see the huge difference between it being the mouth of a wolf or the mouth of a sheep. You're just getting bit at that moment. You just want it to stop, right? But even when we're getting bit by someone, Jesus is reminding us that the way we view them is incredibly important. They're not the dangerous wolf. They're the lost sheep. And another thing that we need to keep in mind as we go into this process of restoration, the goal is to restore the relationship, not convict. The goal is to restore the relationship, not to convict. So over the last 15, 12-ish years, okay, there have been more times than I can count of people, including church leaders, right, Uh, church leaders, people in the congregation who have come and who have asked that church discipline be applied to a certain individual. Not every situation, 
But I will be honest, the vast majority of the situations, even when church leaders, okay, so this is now, I'm, I'm talking about situations all prior to, to us moving to Jackson, okay? So I don't want anyone, to, your imagination, to run wild with you. I think he's talking about the person three rows back because I've been suspicious. It's not what we're doing, okay? But the vast majority of those situations, as we've kind of walked it through with the individual who's pursuing that church discipline or wants the individual pursued, it doesn't come out of a motivation of restoring the relationship, although sometimes that language is being used. Most often, it's being brought out of, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm hurt, I feel defamed, I feel slandered, I feel sinned against, and I want everyone else to see it. I want everyone else to know that I have been hurt and I have been spoken against. I want everyone else to view that person the same way that I view this person, with anger and with disgust. Those are never the words that are used, but most often, not always, most often, that's the underlying tone. And if we're to truly value the other person, that is lived out by this constant pursuit of not conviction, right? I, what I mean by conviction is like in a court of law or in the court of public opinion, that kind of conviction, not like the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We want the person convicted uh, in the eye of church opinion of our view of them, and it has to be this desire to restore. In other words, I think last week we said they have to be important to you. People have to be important to you. This person has to be important to you. You grieve the loss of relationship and you yearn for that relationship to be reconnected. If that isn't the starting point, where it ends will always be ugly, okay? It will always be ugly. It will never be Christ-centered. By the way, for you, it will never be joyous, okay? You'll never have joy where it ends, even though you think you might. Even when you are vindicated in front of the entire church body and the entire church leadership and everybody that you know, I'm telling you, you will not have joy because the joy is found in being in a right relationship with our Father. And if that's your attitude, you don't have a right relationship at that moment in time. And joy is found when we're in a right relationship with his people. It is so important, so central to the body of Christ that we're commanded by God not to take communion unless we're in a right relationship with our God and with others, right? And what saddens me, and I've run into this forever, Uh, Even before I was a pastor, what saddens me is there are people every single time, in our case, once a month, every single time communion is brought forward, they don't take communion. And if if they happen to be open enough to tell you why, often it's because, I'm not talking about the person who skips it once in a while, I'm talking about the person who just skips it all the time. Well, why are you skipping it? Well, I'm not in the right relationship with so-and-so. Do you realize the command in Corinthians is not to skip communion if you're not in a right relationship with somebody? The command is to get up, fix the relationship with somebody, and then come back and continue in the worship service. That's the biblical command. And yet somehow we fall into this perpetual conflict state. We're unhappy that there's a loss of relationship, but we're no longer having a heart that pursues reconciliation. This is the very thing that Matthew 18, this is why this sermon was preached, right? Because somebody, even the apostles themselves, had a wrong view on the importance of other people, okay? Okay, so we're a couple of things before we even get into Matthew 18, okay? Okay, one, uh, there's a huge difference, verse th- or uh, number three. There's a huge difference between things that offend you and true offenses. So look at Matthew 18, okay? And now let's look specifically at verse 15. It says, if your brother sins, or some versions say, if your brother sins against you, okay? If your brother, I think King James uses the word trespass. If he commits a trespass against you, some versions unfortunately use the word offense, It's a great word. It's a wonderful biblical word. But here's the the problem with that. Too many people come to Matthew 18, 15 and say, so-and-so's offended me, okay? And so now we got to deal with it, okay? We live in an offense-based culture. I mean, we do. I, I I don't know what it must be like for third world countries to view us right? Uh, We mentioned this, I think, the other week, but we're a society of victims. I mean, we are. We do victimhood like nobody's business. We're just really, really good at it, right? Uh, 
And so the, the chief offense in the United States, the, the, the biggest wrong that you can commit against somebody is to offend them. And we make fun of, if you're politically conservative, I'm not saying you gotta be, I'm just assuming maybe some of you are. If you're politically conservative, we tend to really make fun of the political liberals uh, because they seem to get offended by everything, right? But if we would take a step back and look at your own movement or my own movement, we do the same thing. We just get really offended at stuff. Uh, you, you go into, um, or maybe you work at an employment place and your employer says, you can no longer say, bless you to the customers. What are we, we Facebook about that. That's what we do, right? Uh, there's articles on Breitbart or whatever it is. I mean, just there's entire things about how wrong that is. And that is wrong. And that is horrible. And that is disgusting. Now compare that with Paul who was stoned and left for dead, right? Not sure Paul would be a sympathetic ear to many of the things that we seem to have to endure as evangelical Christians, right? It's not good. Don't, don't, I'm not defending those things at all. I'm just saying we're really good at being offended. That's all I'm saying. That mindset comes into the church, okay? If you would go back in the 1500s, okay, in Europe, and you would not hold to the doctrinal position of any church. It doesn't matter what church you went to, Catholic or Reformed or Baptist really hadn't come out yet, uh, or even the Anabaptists or any of those various movements. If you disagreed with the church's position, you might get burned at the stake, right? Why? Because it was a violent, horrible culture that surrounded the church, and the church acted like the culture around it. Every progressive century, every generation after that, we do, we do the same thing. Sadly, we become our culture, and our culture will not tolerate being offended. And so very often, that becomes the core issue and the source of conflicts within our evangelical churches. Someone's offended somebody, and now there's a war. But if your version uses the word offense, I want to be very clear with what Scripture's talking about here. It's not talking about you being personally offended by someone's behavior or action or you disagreeing with somebody's words or clothing choices or whatever it might be. It's talking about things that God himself would view as sinful. They've actually sinned. They've broken a command of God. They're living in a way that isn't holy. It isn't righteous. It's pursuing the ways, the values, of the world. It's something that God has declared to be sinful and they are doing that sinful thing. That's what Matthew 18, 15 is referring to, okay? So here's the context. People have to be so important to you that even when sin comes in and grabs their heart and that sin therefore destroys or eats away or brings conflict into their relationship with others, yourself included, that they are so important to you that even their sins directed against you, you won't let those sins get in the way of pursuing a relationship with them. Now truly, that sin has to be dealt with for that relationship to be restored, which is what Matthew 18, 15 through 17 is about. But they have to be so important to you, these sheep that are lost. So verse 12 through 14 gives this metaphor that we just read about these lost sheep. Cute, adorable little sheep. You've clearly never been a shepherd, if that's your view. But nonetheless, these cute little cuddly things, right? And we got this image of the Savior with this little lamb, right? It's all white, and it's really cute, and it's adorable, and he's holding it, right? Now verse 15 changes that metaphor. It's this snarling, snapping, angry thing that you've went and picked it up. It's just ticked off, right? So verses 17 or 15 through 17 is Jesus saying, even that snarling, snapping, biting creature has to be important to you. So important that you want the relationship fixed and restored. So how do we handle this? So again, Matthew 18 Verse 15, if your brother sins, commits an offense against God and truly an offense against you, right? Maybe that's an issue of slander, right? Maybe that's some other intentional act that's being committed against you, right? You feel the sting 
sting and you feel the bite. It's personal, or at least you perceive it to be so, okay? If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault in private. This is number four. Number four basically is this. Just, Jesus is telling us to keep things small. Keep things small. We have a tendency when we're hurt to go big. A few years back, I had a brother in the church come to me, and he was very angry and upset with our uh, other pastor. Okay. And, uh, and he came to me privately, and he began laying out a list of grievances and offenses that he had against this pastor. There were really no discernible sin issues in the mix, just a bunch of things that he didn't like, but he was really angry about them. Uh, and, and about five or 10 minutes into the conversation, I just stopped and said, now, I assume that you've went and you've spoken to Pastor Jeff about these things. Well, well no, I, I haven't done that. Okay, brother, I gotta be honest with you. We probably need to back up here a little bit. Uh, that's where you need to go first. You need to go to him to see if you can resolve some of these things. So let me just challenge you with this. One, prayerfully consider this list because there's actually, I mean, there's a, like a real written list. Prayerfully consider this list that you've given me. Try to discern if there's actual sin issues here or things that are harmful to the body of Christ uh, and then take those issues to him first and try to solve them there. Uh, and, and then he added this comment. He said, you know what, thank you. That's, that's probably really good advice. Uh, I have been very, very, very careful not to tell anybody about this, but pastor, this is really serious. There's 18 other families in the church that agree with me. So, okay. But he was convinced he's not told anybody, right? Uh, and so that we, we had to kind of walk through that issue uh, as well. What Jesus is saying is, you know what? They've hurt you. I get it. All right, I get it. They've slandered you. They've bit you. And it hurts. And you're mad. Or you're wounded. But you keep it small. Because this other person still has to be so important to you that you seek to protect their reputation even against their own sinful actions. That you desire their reputation to be so good, other people to view them positively, that when they sin, you don't want anybody else to know about the sin. You want to go to them privately to help remove that sin from their life because you value them and you value how other people see them, right? That's the idea that's being presented here. So keep your finger in Matthew 18 and flip back with me to Deuteronomy, Old Testament, right? And you know when you go Old Testament, things are getting kind of serious. So Deuteronomy chapter 19. I'm just saying that because the Old Testament is great. It's powerful. It's really not a soft and cuddly section of the Bible, right? I mean, it tends to be pretty hard-hitting at times. And, and, and the law section, Deuteronomy, is certainly no exception to that. So Deuteronomy 19, 15. So the context that's being given in Matthew 18 is if someone actually sins. And, and notice the presumption. It's presuming that the person's actually sinned against you, Okay. Uh, it, it's just coming, kind of coming from that point. It doesn't mean they've actually sinned against you, but that's the mindset that Jesus is saying. In other words, even if it's true that what they did is actually true, they actually sinned against you, okay? Deuteronomy 19.15 is coming at it from the opposite side. We get to the same conclusion, but it assumes the opposite. It assumes that there's a false witness who's saying something wrong or untrue and accusing someone falsely, but it gives the, the exact same process, okay? So if you hear that language difference, it's because they're both kind of starting at different points. So Deuteronomy 19.15 a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of an iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter will be confirmed. Now that section, that last line, Jesus quotes directly in Matthew 18, 16, okay? Look at verse 16. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, in other words, someone who just won't let it go, there's not two or three witnesses. No one else can speak to the issue, but they will not let the matter, they will not let the accusation drop, okay? 
Then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge evil from among you. Okay, so the idea here is what happens if there's someone who just won't let an accusation go. But notice the protection that's put in place. Whether it's because the person is being accused falsely or even, as in the case of Matthew 18, the person is being accused correctly. In either case, do you see that attempt to protect that individual's reputation within the community? If they're being accused falsely, then it's very clear why we want to protect their reputation. It's also very clear why two or three witnesses are needed in order to convict someone of wrongdoing. But even if someone actually does the sin, Jesus is saying that burden of proof, that two or three people, that you going to them privately with no one else in the know, that's still important. Why? Because their reputation must be important to you. Because they're important to you, or at least they're supposed to be. And if they're not, then you need to stop the whole process and go back to the beginning, right? Because the problem isn't just with them. Now the problem is with you. I, I, I think if we make a mistake and we make a danger, it's usually on point number four. We fail to keep things small. We fail to keep things small. We're in a rush to be seen as right. Right? Now, I don't know if the following story is true. Uh, I was told that it was. I've read it in several sources. I'm still trying to find sort of the original source for it. But uh, there is a story that comes uh, from Spurgeon's uh, life, that Baptist preacher in London uh, a few generations back. And he had a mega church before people knew what mega churches were. In fact, at that time period, no one even knew how to deal with a crowd of 10,000 people coming to a church in a single location on a given Sunday. It was simply unheard of, right? But you had this young, he started preaching when he was 17, first church, first pastor, when he was 17 years old. Okay, this gifted, fiery preacher that could connect to the masses, educated and uneducated alike. They flocked to hear Spurgeon speak. So he had this huge church building that they constructed, which is still in existence, by the way. It, this huge edifice, people coming to it, standing room only. In fact, there was a shout of a fire. Someone did that maliciously. There were so many people they tried to get out. Actually, some people were trampled to death. Uh, and Spurgeon about resigned from the pastor after that. He was so crushed by that situation. But that gives you an idea of how many people were cramming into this building to hear him speak. So big name pastor, every edition of the paper during the years that he was a pastor always included an article about him, usually in the gossip section because it was sort of big news. One of the scandals that erupted was that Spurgeon would man a table, often personally, himself being there, would man a table in the lobby of the church and he would sell chicken eggs, okay? Admittedly, an odd thing for your pastor to do on a Sunday morning, granted, okay? And he was uh, just accused of that. I mean, it was just, it became a big issue. It so big, it actually hit the papers. I mean, this greedy pastor, it's not enough for him to be paid a salary by the biggest church in the entire country. He's now hawking merchandise on Sunday morning. And it wasn't until after his death, all of those years of those accusations, many of which were coming from within the body. I'm not even defending the wisdom or the lack thereof of what Spurgeon did. I'm just trying to give this to tell the story. It was absolutely, after he died that the full story came out and the entire time period he did that in order to support a widow within the church who was trying to make ends meet and he realized that if his name was attached to it and he was manning the booth he would sell far more eggs for her all the money all the proceeds went to her to support a living for her and her children now again the wisdom issues notwithstanding it brings something to the table of how quickly we take things and make things big. Can you imagine if whoever, even multiple individuals, had they went to Spurgeon privately 
instead of taking it to the public meetings and into the newspaper articles, if they had went to the man privately to ask, to clarify, all those years of accusation and slander would have been rendered unnecessary. We have this tendency to go big and to go big quickly because we feel offended, we feel insulted, we feel attacked. And scripture comes at it from a very different point of view. And that says this, or number five, point number five says this. We need to be very careful about going public. There's a three-step process. One, we go to the individual, right? We can't solve it with that individual when we go to them privately. Being very careful not to bring anybody else into the situation. Then we're, we bring other people who can confirm the person's wrongdoing, right? And that, that point's pretty important too. When that doesn't work, then and only then do we dare even think about taking this on a broader scale. The whole idea of Matthew 18, 15 through 17 is to get you and I to slow down, to keep things small. When there's a conflict, if you invite 15 people in the room to try to solve it, I guarantee you, you will never solve that conflict, right? Now you've got 15 people's opinions and you've got people's egos that are being bruised and you've got individuals who are feeling defensive because now all these other people are in the room hearing what's going on. Those things only serve to enlarge the conflict, never to keep it small. And, and, and so let me just, let me end it with this. When we, when we begin this process of restoring broken relationships. One, we gotta begin with some hard work with ourselves before we ever confront. But two, Matthew 18, if it says anything, it's saying this. Our motivation has to be in the right place. And we have to look at our heart deeply and pray, because our heart is a deceitful, tricky thing, right? We've gotta take this matter before God on a regular basis to ensure that the way we're approaching it, the way we're viewing the person, the way we're having the conversations is tailored towards bringing peace and not a declaration of war. But what so often happens, and sometimes I, I play the role of mediator and I've been in situations where other people have had to be the mediator, right? What tends to happen in those situations is that we bring to the table all of the things that we have wrong with the other person. Well, I can't fix this. I can't be in a right relationship with you until you recognize this, 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 and this, and you admit that you said this on this date with this tone of voice and this facial expression, right? And they're just like, wait a minute, I don't even agree with that. But we bring articles of war, not declarations of peace. Now, there's a, there's a process, there's a, there's a way that we need to go through this. We're going to look at some passages of Scripture uh, next week as we look at the process through which we need to go to solve something. Matthew 18 is a process statement, but it's really more about motivation. It's more about what's motivating your heart. Is this person important to me? And do I really want this issue fixed? Or do I just want other people to see them as being guilty? Jesus says a lot about relationships, and here's why. He went to such great lengths to fix our relationship with him. He overcame so very much. He let so much go. He covered over a multitude of wrongs, literally every wrong we've ever committed. Jesus' love through his blood covered all of those things, right? Right? We can't then say that our relationships aren't that big of a deal to God when the cosmic creator of the universe gave up temporarily his glory, endured the humility of being a human being, went through the agony of the cross, died that miserable death, overcame death by virtue of his own power. His blood covered all of those sins to restore relationship. If our God went to that great of a length, to fix a relationship. I think you and I just checking our hearts and having the right motivation and valuing the other person in comparison isn't that big of a deal. Would you pray with me? Our Father, as we continue to go through this series and fixing relationships, here's my prayer. There are so many people who have been truly hurt 
And Father, I get it. It is not easy to be talked about. It's not easy to be sinned against. It hurts. It angers us. And Father, there are people, I'm assuming, who are in this church body who feel the burden of a reputation which has been harmed by the words and actions of other people. Would you protect us from a spirit of defensiveness? And instead, Lord, would we go into those situations and into those conflicts wanting only one thing, to get our friend back, to get the relationship back. And we recognize this is not always possible, but Father, may the error, may the fault never lie with our mindset and our approach. Would you put in us a heart that is so in love with other people that all we want, all we desire, all we pray for is for peace and reconciliation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.